the way we work doesn't seem to have any definitive uh, formula or system um but i'm sure that despite feeling that i have no system there must be a system by which i work maybe a unconscious one Singh Chaudhary, thank you so much, and uh, for giving me your time and welcome to my space. First of all, thank you very much. And really delighted to be here. Finally, we've uh, managed to see each other after a long time. And my first memory of you is in 2007 when you brought uh, the play called The Suit to Ram yeah. Mandir, and it was a play about marital infidelity and marital politics. And one. thing remained with me is after the play like a member of the audience stood up and asked you but would a uh, indian husband accept his unfaithful wife the way the protagonist in the play accepted uh, you know and you said i don't care and uh, because choices are not linear <laughs> and that stayed with me you know and uh, then in 2014 i interviewed again and that was the time when you are in anthamuti had just passed and you had brought nagamandala to rangashankara and i remember you saying that you know there was a now there is a fracture in the character of the the nation and i don't know what kind of amrit mantra is going to cleanse us of what is going on and you were talking also about the shrinking spaces for dissent and a lot has happened since 2014 and yet the one thing that hasn't changed is the fact that you continue to create through heartbreak through loss through grief through disillusion and i don't know how and where from where do you get that strength so just tell me just how do you manage to just go on creating through so many different things that are happening around you and in your life that's a tough question you asked as a starting question but i will answer it in uh, the way i can articulate it i think in a certain way uh, grief and loss is a space where i feel like a immigrant uh, it's not a space which i'm familiar with or i familiarized myself with before entering into it but i think the only thing that assuaged or because grief has no expiry date loss has no expiry date um but the only place where i felt real and i felt i was dealing with some fundamental questions that i was asking myself was in a rehearsal space with actors it was the space where i could make the invisible visible the inarticulate i could define uh again not in any definite way with the same ambiguity with which we deal with processes and creative spaces so i i think um, i think theater you know like people go to god people go to meditation camps uh, there are so many ways that you find um you 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 search for ways to preserve your sanity to preserve your sense of life or being for me theater is the space it's a space where i can articulate the inarticulate as i said you know so perhaps that could be the reason i remember when i when i lost my husband who i was very very close to who was really somebody with whom um i shared a lot i was in a mess but it was theater that gave me uh the place to reflect on what had happened because you don't it's also you know loss is so um intangible it's so elusive 
it's it's not uh, it's there lodged within you and there's no expiry date to it but it's really a foreign land for people who are not um I mean, I'm, I'm basically, I think, I like to be happy. I think it's an, it's, it's an acquired habit, like all the other tastes that we acquire. I like to feel that I want to be happy. Yeah. And um, when that is by certain circumstances removed or pulled from under your, under your feet, you know, one day everything is okay and the next moment life that you were familiar with has done such a somersault that you have absolutely no skills, you have no training, you have no uh, techniques to how to deal with it. So in a certain way, theater is my, I won't say it's my refuge or my, but it's a place where, like Henry Miller says, you can wear the robe of a priest and be completely private, silent, um, and try to find a redefinition of what it means to be alive. I remember like any conversation with you is never really about the frivolities. You know, it's always about something larger, uh, something more profound than what is visible. And your work is also like that. The last conversation I had with you in 2014, you also were talking about how as an artist and as a human being, every grief, every tragedy is your business. You know, it's not as if you can stay far removed from uh, pain because it doesn't belong to you. And uh, your own pain has been like so profound and uh, so huge in the sense that your parents uh, were survivors of partition, correct me if I'm wrong. And, Absolutely. And, and in 1984, I mean, your sister and you both went through uh, trauma uh, when the riots were happening in uh, Delhi, right? You, would, you spoke to me about this and I don't want to go into the details of what you spoke, told me because I don't want you to go into that space. But despite that and what you just told me, your own grief and the, all the stress and the isolation of the pandemic, um, and you still managed to create a piece called The Black Box, you know, maybe in, uh, to, as a tribute to the pain of the migrants. And I just, I just find this so uh, amazing that you're able to transcend your own pain and you're able to create, you know, these threads that combine all of us, that bring us all together. I think that is, do you think that is the purpose of art and of artists to find I things that bring think... people together rather than isolate them and divide them, which is happening a lot uh, these days? I don't know what the purpose of art is. You know, it's what, it, it would mean different things to different artists. But I do know that you respond to the times. It's about empathy. You know, it's like Judith Butler says, I can't quote her verbatim, you know, we may not belong to a certain world. Maybe I have not left my home in a hurry, carrying my little bundle of something. I may not have done that journey, or I may not have felt the pain of the partition directly. But it's not that you are not responding or you're not reacting, not in, not in some kind of fake bleeding heart syndrome. Because I think an artist just respond to the times. Either you create a fantasy world, which is equally valid as an artist. You create your own metaphors. You create your own images. You create your own world, which has nothing to do with the collapse of the universe that is happening around you. Or you respond to the world in which you live. Perhaps earlier when I did Yarma and Naga Mandala and Mad Woman of Shayo and... Um, you know, these larger than uh, Mogra, uh, Fedra. I was creating my own universe, a universe of love, of loss, of grief, of happiness, of sexuality, of uh, desire. You know, I was, I was dealing with, uh, with, with that particular kind of imagined space. But the imagination is part of me, so it's got to stem from somewhere within my own experiences and my own understanding of touch, smell, um, breath. Right. Um, but now I seem to be 
not as a conscious thing. It's just that I, I can't get away from stuff like migration, dislocation, fractured identities, what home means to you, what displacement means. The last seven, eight plays that I've done, you know, whether it was productions with the National School of Drama for their third year students, it was based on stories of Manto. Uh, uh, I seem to be just so concerned about issues like that. I, it could be considered that I do not belong to that world. But which world do I belong to? What is my internal world? It's my private space. It's my own private secret. Nobody knows what I'm responding to. Yeah. How does it reflect in your work? Directly, indirectly, through metaphors, through images. Uh, sometimes it's not even visible, but that could be the impulse behind the creation. And it's been such a long journey. Um, if uh, I remember correctly, you passed out of uh, the National School of Drama, I think in 1975. Yes, exactly. Yep. I think uh, you trained under Ibrahim al Ghazi, and you also had interactions, very fulfilling and enriching interactions with people like Balwant Garki and uh, Mr. Karat, right? How do you remember them today? Because I think again, correct me if I'm wrong, that you, they kind of shaped you a little into the storyteller that you are today, apart from many other influences that I are too numerous to uh, discuss here. How do you remember them? And do you think that the creative environment that you blossomed in would be available to a young theater aspirant today? I feel really very fortunate because a good teacher, and that's what I try to bring into my own profession as a teacher, a good teacher like Ibrahim al Qasi can make you see the universe in a manner which is surprised by the familiar, as Bertolt Brecht would, see, would say. And once you've been, when I joined the NST, it was basically mindless meandering. I came from Amritsar, I came from a middle class family. Art could be seen as a hobby, but never as a profession. It's just that I had parents who were. I wouldn't call them progressive, or I wouldn't say that they were, um, you know, what you would say, very modern or forward thinking. No, but they gave us, uh, parenting was not so restrictive or prescriptive. They let us be. I was not particularly bright in school. So my being in art seemed like, okay, you know, thoda sa painting karti hai, thoda sa uh, poetry likhti hai, kahani likhti hai, you know, so it was all because my parents never kind of, uh, never hammered me into achieving marks. Mm -hmm. Even though I had a brother and sister who were always toppers, I was really at the bottom of the barrel. So it was kind of, there was no pressure. And in those days, you know, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. There was no, uh, there was no sense of uh, a career, or the options of not being able to get into college. Those pressures were not part of my life. Right. And uh, I think it was a chance meeting with Ibrahim al Qazi when I was doing my master's under Dr. B. N. Goswami, another magnificent teacher, that I heard a lecture of Ibrahim al Qazi, And he spoke a language which I'd never heard in my provincial space that I occupied. So joining theater was more to get rid of boredom than for any burning um, artistic uh, desires. But once you get a teacher who is who is not only teaching you about Chekhov and Racine or Sophocles, he's actually teaching you about life. He's exposing you to art, he's exposing you to music, he's exposing you to a certain kind of aesthetics, he's exposing you to um, detailing. I was a completely useless student at the NST. I want to underscore that. I don't think I did any roles or I, because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't speak Hindi and the language of instruction was in Hindi. I knew Punjabi, but not like I speak now because that time you went to convents and you kind of felt very fancy that you spoke English. Uh, I, was a, I was a product of a certain time 
and a certain post-colonial vestigial residue of that time. So um, I learned everything by observation. I observed how he structured a scene. I observed the way he detailed the objects on the stage, the entries and the exits, the composition. So I observed that art is hard. That's what he told, what he shared through his own ways of working. And then I, uh, I left the NST quite, got married. Uh, again, I went into a, a big Punjabi um, patriarchal family. Fortunately, I had a husband who wasn't carrying those uh, uh, values at all. And so I did, I worked with Pearl Padamsi, did little bits of children's theater, did her costume, organized the chai. I always saw myself on the periphery. I never saw myself, I thought, ye mazedar environment hai, I like the atmosphere, I like the smell, but I never saw myself as having any special capacity or creativity or to use a word which I feel reluctant to use, but I'll use it because I can't, can't find an alternative word for it. I didn't feel I had any special talent. I think some way to challenge my limitations, I got into a serious space when I moved to Bharat Bhavan in Popal. Again, my husband got a transfer. It was an accident of destiny which worked marvelously for me. I started working with B.V. Karan, a great stalwart. So on one hand, you had a Renaissance man like Ibrahim Al-Khazi. On the other hand, you had a man who celebrated theater. Everything was improvised. It, it, had, it was rooted in, um, uh, in what you would call local indigenous traditions. So it became a wonderful exposure I had to two different kinds of thoughts. And then I came to, my husband again got a posting to Chandika. I was so unhappy because I just loved Popal. You had spaces where you could work, you had actors, you had endless money. I felt like that was my space. And then suddenly I'm shoved back to Chandika, a city which I didn't particularly like when I was a student because I found it just... Um, you know, that time Chandigarh had just come as a blueprint. So there were not enough trees and there were very straight lines and it didn't have the fervor and the passion of Amritsar and the hawkers and no street life. But nevertheless, I came to Chandigarh and I remember Karanji telling me, wherever you go, you must work by forgetting us. He said, your work must be regional, it must be local and it must be vernacular. Mm maybe because there was so much love and respect and friendship and admiration that I had for these two stalwarts. Alkazi, of course, was the director. Uh, he, uh, I learned enormously from the way he worked. But from current, I got, a, I got a key, I got a quote that whatever work I do must be in the Punjabi language. Mm. Because when I was... A way, when I was in Bhopal, everyone used to say, Are Punjabi, you know, Gidda Bhangra. Not that I, I think these are very robust traditions and I love them. But when I think of the whole Sufiana Kalam, the Guru Granth Sahib, written in such beautiful Gurmukhi, where did this distortion of language really happen? Mm -hmm. So for me, coming back to Punjab, not so much to Punjab, but Chandigarh, was actually also making a journey into the, because language is not just words, it's cultural history, it's imagery, it's, uh, it's so many things. Uh, so I was very fortunate that I, uh, I have a, I think I'm just fortunate that I met the right people at the right time. And because as I said, I was so full of limitations, limitations of imagination, limitations of confidence, limitations of my own capacity, limitations of where I belonged. You know, even in Bharat Bhavan, I was buying curtains, I was doing costumes, I was saying, I, was, I had 10 tailors in my house, you know, stitching for plays that Karanji was doing or organizing workshops. But I was not, I, I liked that role because it was, a, it, it, it invisibilized me. 
And I like that sense of not being visible. Um, and then I came to Chandigarh and I formed my own theater company. I met Surjit Pater, who's like one of the finest poets that Punjab has. I heard his, I heard one of his plays, which he translated. It wasn't such an incredible production, but that sound and that, you know, it was, it was so mesmerizing. And I didn't know Punjabi at that time. And I thought, yes, Zuban, you know, it hit somewhere. It hit into my forgotten memories. It hit into my subconscious layers. It hit into my uh, history. And so I had a wonderful collaboration with him. And through my journey with Surjit Pater, I learned the language. Mm -hmm. I learned how to read. I learned how to, I mean, today I have a, a very good vocabulary in Punjabi. I can correct enunciations and pronunciations. And B.V. Karnath used to come all the way from wherever he was to design the music for my plays. So it became a collaboration of two great masters. And I kind of willy-nilly got into that space and grew with the kind of growth that they made possible for me. The other question that I asked, do you think that kind of creative environment would be available to somebody you know, wanted to go into theater and blossom just like you did? I don't think so. I think the situation is so dismal. It's so dismal that I feel my life, I'm at the edge of, end of my life. Uh, if I don't do another play, it doesn't matter. I want to, but if I can't, because funding is not available or space is not available, it's all right. It's okay. But I feel it's such a tragedy for young people because that kind of investment that the teachers that I interacted with had in young people, the kind of challenges they threw, the kind of pushing to the edge of their own capacity or their own potential that they, uh, you know, it's like putting somebody on a precipice and saying, you either die or you fly. I think is, uh, I don't see it. I remember reading somewhere that uh... You said that Ibrahim uh, Al Ghazi, you know, taught you that theatre was not a hobby. Yeah. And that you had to give it the same kind of passion and the same kind of uh, commitment that you would give to a career in engineering or medicine or whatever. You know, uh, if, somebody, if somebody would ask you today, like a young person would come to you for advice, the way he advised you, how would you advise somebody who's starting today? in this environment? What would you say? It's a very difficult question because today I think uh, the space that is available to us is so fraught with auto censorship. There is a fear syndrome. You can't create and be fearful. You know, institutions are filled with uncertainty about how to position themselves ideologically. You can't be fearless. You can't say, you can't make mistakes. There's no one to pull you up. So, I mean, it's a, you're asking very difficult questions, but these are very important questions because I, I mean, I see the department where I taught at the university uh, for almost 27 years, 26 years, I taught there. Today, there are no teachers. The students are hanging around. Nobody, because we, not, we were not only taught about, I mean, I'm telling you, a teacher like al -Kazi used to say that after lunch, we have rehearsals. Please, everybody brush their teeth and come to rehearsal. Because when you, this is a space of intimacy. I don't want your food breath to make it difficult for your co-actor to you know, I don't want them to negotiate with that. Um, he, 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 gave a, he would go to the library and check if he issued a book that month. If he hadn't issued a book, he would come and say, you didn't, you haven't read any book this month. It would almost shame us into hurrying to the library and issuing books. And then he would say, which book have you issued? And discuss it. I mean, that kind of involvement, that kind of engagement. That in the, I mean, I remember he taught, you know, my seniors were Ompuri and 
Nasir and, you know, really stalwarts. He taught them, he used to give them ties, teach them how to tie a tie. Because we all came from small towns. He would invite us to his house where we he would have Ram Kumar and, uh, you know, maybe Isim Zaykel. So that we also knew that there were some great artists in this country and not shrivel up with fear. There was one five-star hotel. He would bundle four students in his car and take them to a five-star hotel so that tomorrow if you enter into a larger life, there is no diffidence in ordering a cappuccino. Uh, so there were many, many little things which in retrospect were so valuable in making us enter in, because theater, in any world you enter, whether you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, there's a world you enter. That world which perhaps is not available to you when you come from a small town, from a space which is, uh, which is not expansive to what is happening in modernity. So um, yes, he did say that this, you cannot treat theater as a hobby class. It it's, has to be treated with the same dedication, commitment, and absolute concentration as required to be a doctor or a lawyer. Or he's, he's, so he, he instilled a sense of the value of this profession, an ethical code he gave us, an ethical muscle. I think that is what is really missing in institutions, an ethical muscle. What would inspire somebody to get into theater today? I think your own artistic impulses, after all, it is a very exciting space to be in. It's a very difficult space to be in because it deals with collaboration, it deals with group activity, it deals with funding, it deals with shows, it deals with festivals, it deals with organizations. So it's a much more complex world to be in. It has, in the hierarchy, it comes a little low, but, uh, as a painter, you can be in a space which is you and your canvas or you and your computer or your notebook and your sheaves of paper uh, or your tanpura or your riyas. But this is this you can't do in isolation. It's like uh, in the Natya Shastras, they say, Natak wohi kar sakte hai, jiska kutum ho. So the sense of community is a very important dimension what it means to be in a theater, human management. Yeah, yeah. It's in every profession, but here it becomes more sharp. You once said uh, uh, that, you know, you, there can't be rigidity and uh, fixed notions, fixed ideas about anything in art or in life. And this is the conversation I remember when we met last. And so you can't have fixed notions about life and art. And your work has also so the same kind of fluidity because you, you as you said, you, know, you uh, take, you draw inspiration from various literary and dramatic sources you know, from all over the world, but you interpret them with regional idioms, right? And you, you uh, show that, you know, multiple perspectives and ideas can coexist harmoniously and that synergies can be built you know, between different regions and cultures and genders and, uh, you know, urban artists and folk artists. And like you said, it's a collaborative uh, space. But as we have been discussing, those spaces of collaboration are shrinking now. And so where do you see the future of artists and theater in the India that we are living in? I can't see. Maybe if you'd asked me this question five years ago, I would have a more confident sharing with you. At the moment, it seems a bit bleak. Uh, there was a time when, you know, funding is very tight. Uh, you get funding for doing things which are more in tandem with notions of nationalism. You know, what you men mentioned about the synergy and the idiomatic uh, uh, pulling out from different sources is what is so enriching about this country, the multiplicity. There were no singulars. It was all about multitudinous singularities that one could dip into, which was so enriching. And as I said, I've been crossing genders. I've been, when I cast my characters, I don't say that the woman must get the female role. Even a male can 
be a female without using any of the troops or what it means to be a female big boobs big lips false eyelashes none of that that you play the the woman is a dimension of the character that you're portraying it's not it's not through gender that you're playing but the character that you're playing and that also involves the gender but i think today one is so cautious um that uh, i don't know i mean i find everybody is doing jhansi ki rani khub ladi mardani so all the plays that you see on facebook that my own uh, contemporaries are doing it's got to do with something which suits the national narrative mm. and when that becomes an imperative rather than your own creative spaces then you don't know how to map out the future because is the map the future based on expediency expediency of self preservation or is it based on the madness of your creativity and the funny thing which i find uh, to be so ironical is that the things which are being done today have been done in the past and much better without the kind you know that we see i mean charsi kirani was done in the 50s you know uh, by sohrab modi so it's not yeah. they are doing anything new i mean it and it's all been there it's all been part of our cultural narrative and history and cinematic history so this whole narrative that somehow these things are only being done today it's just uh, not very truthful so what happens is it was when we were seeking a sense of identity in a new nation you were seeking a sense of ourselves you do dip into history you do dip into the past yeah to create uh, i mean you mentioned sorab modi and one can uh, there's a plethora of those kind of examples available but when somebody has a hammer and says only this is acceptable then you either withdraw yeah or you fulfill i just also wanted to ask you i mean it's i don't want to call you a woman uh, you know theater icon because your work is not about you know these cliches and these cliched identifications and all that but you started uh, the company which is your you know collective of music and art and you know so much work that has been done through the through the decades and as a lone radical voice uh in theater in punjab for so many decades do you feel lonely and tired at times i don't feel tired but i i do feel that uh, um i don't get much support from the city or the language in which i perform so i don't see that because my work doesn't fit into a template of what is easily accessible Uh, i think it's got nothing to do with being personal nothing personal or being a woman i think the way i work is not perhaps uh, fitting into what you would call the popular um, kind of acting if you've seen punjabi plays mm. you know they have a certain kind of uh, um, stereotyping of what it means to be an old woman to be a penga in the village to be a gabru to be a um uh, he you know so i remember many years ago i think i've told the story but i'm telling it after a long time the first play i did was he ranja in uh, punjab and i went to varisha i didn't go i didn't have any available text i went to varisha and there was one line which became so powerful for me when he is defying the kazi and defying her father so this they are pleading with her is uh, the wo she says hunna mura mein ranj ranj de to paave baap te baap ta baap aa jaye i love that sentence but that was not part of popular memory mm. so when i performed it in punjab there was a complete furor because he was supposed to be virginal i mean i was thinking she doesn't go at night to give churi to ranja under the tree and she just feeds him and uh comes back without having hugged him or kissed him or made love to him so i wasn't carrying any of those those cliche baggages with me and 
I really got slaughtered mm. because they said, how can you use a line like, Hunna mura me ranjane to paave baap te baap ta baap a jai. Seemed like such a subversive sentence. But it was from Barish Shah. All these stories of these lovers, Soni Mehwal or Hiranja or Sassi Puni, they were all bagis, you know, they were all rebels, they were radical. But you've taken the radicalization out of them and made them into little cardboard figures. So I suppose I don't do that, that kind of, I don't know. I mean, how would I know? Maybe they don't like my work. What I feel is that despite the challenges, the, whatever it is that is going wrong around us, I think people like you matter. Your voice matters. The body of work you have created matters. And I just wanted to know that it has made such a difference to so many of us. Every time you speak, every time you write, every time you connect with even an ind individual uh, or an audience through a work of art that you create, you change the world. So, and you yourself, I think, said somewhere that, you know, regardless of the darkness, one must always hope. So, I want you to feel that. I no, I do. Even the, even the new play that I'm doing, which is a collaboration with Gauri Institute and Rangashankara, this play that I'm doing, it's called Trunk Tales. Um, again, because despite the fact that they're fun, but it's not enough. And given the times, COVID times and all the circumstances that we are passing through, you can't have huge ensemble work. Mm -hmm. So my work has also gone through a metamorphosis because of circumstances. Um, Trunk Tales is, uh, I, I always say that no matter how dark the story is or how savage the times is, there must be affirmation yeah. at the end. Unless there is some sense of hope and some sense of that there is a light. There's no point in working. So I don't see my work as bleak or dark. I see it as with somewhere instincts of survival, instincts to continue to keep on uh, moving into fresh terrains yeah. is a continuous journey. And also, uh, you know, just the fact that you are here and you have been continuously enduring and creating, you know, that gives us a lot of hope and inspiration. And every time I look at your, your you know, luminous eyes, they're just <laughs> full of light. And I always think of them as, you know, I think they're like a metaphor for your work because they have such unsparing honesty and also this staggering kindness in them. And the work is also like that. And I want thank to you so much. I want to Such lovely you. compliments. I just want to thank you for continue to be you and holding on to that muscle of integrity and you know that absolute that humanness that you have that you've never given up, regardless of the challenges in front of you. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Lovely talking to you. Bye bye. Hi, this is Reema and if you liked what you just saw, then um, do like and subscribe because remember this is a safe space for people to talk, share their stories, to hear each other and basically make some time in their busy lives for unboxed conversations.